All right, so let's uh, uh, come back to what we were talking about just before we went into, well, break-ish, <laughs> um, and talk about buoyancy force. So this is the simulation I set up um, while I was waiting for you guys. So I hope it'll work. This is all arranged so that there's water here. And when you look at this object here, you will see that um, it's not, um, I increased the density. So it's a double the uh, density of water. So, well, I mean, uh, the units here are off because it's a two dimensional simulation. It's a double the density of the liquid. <laughs> so it won't quite float. That's why it's uh, attached um, to this um, spring. If I get rid of the spring, it'll sink as you would imagine. So what I want to show is um, that some sort of simulation evidence that this liquid does provide some force. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark the current position. This is hanging in. And see what happens when I get rid of the liquid. So I'm just going to right click on water and erase. Yeah, it hangs down lower. So, um, so you know, if you're actually making real measurements with uh, real spring scale, then when it hangs lower, this is reading higher amount of force. And when there's a, a liquid there, so it's uh, hanging higher up, it's uh, reading smaller amount of spring force. So what that means is if you are drawing free body diagram, so this object has some um, gravity, mg pulling it down. There's some spring force uh, pulling it up. And I, I guess uh, the correct way to draw it would be this uh, spring force is somehow smaller than gravity because while it's sitting in water, there's an additional force. There's an additional upward force that we might call buoyancy force. So what I want to do in the next 10, 15 minutes is drive a formula for the buoyancy force. That's something that we can actually do with what little we know of uh, flu fluid. So um, it's that picture. Well, do I want? To? No, I should draw a new picture here. So it's this picture that I want you to look at. So to drive the formula for the buoyancy force. We are imagining a container containing, well, liquid. And within this fluid, I, I said the liquid, but it could be gas. Within this fluid is an object. Well, it's all messed up. Um, within this. Fluid. That's been strengthened up a little bit better. Uh, within this fluid is an object. Let me just uh, imagine a cube so that we can um, look at the forces only more easily. Because if it's a sphere, um, it's going to be harder to analyze. Because you know, if uh, you imagine this is a sphere here, then the force due to pressure will be sort of perpendicular to the surface all going around the sphere. And that's just going to be harder to analyze. So for the sake of simplicity, while we are driving the formula, I will use a simpler geometry. And just imagine that I placed a cube here. So a cube is submerged in the liquid. And it doesn't really matter what the density of this cube is, as we'll find out. So I'm just going to you know, not say what its density is. All you have to know, I guess, is that something is holding this cube in the middle of the liquid. Sort of like how something is holding this box in the middle of the liquid. It's not touching the bottom, so there's no normal force for you to worry about, and it's not um, it's not um, outside the liquid, so that we can look at the uh, buoyancy force on the entire object. And we'll go back to the special case that we were looking at earlier. So 
So this is the question we were asking last time. What could be exerting force on this object um, other than you know, gravity? Then the thing that's uh, touching this object is the liquid around it. And a way to express the force due to the liquid around it is first to say, uh, first to describe pressure in the liquid around it. And I, before we went into break, what I wrote down was pressure as a function of position, x, y, and z. But I don't actually need the three coordinates because, um, let's see, let me write it down here. Um, pressure due to weight of fluid, as we derived it before, that, uh, that pressure is equal to density of fluid times g times height, right? So we know that if this is a perfectly still fluid, the only thing that pressure is going to depend on is one of these three variables. So let me just uh, define my coordinate system so that I can say which one it is. Let's say x goes this way, y goes this way, and z actually comes out of the board, but I don't care. I'm not going to deal with the three dimensions if I don't have to. So pressure will be only a function of y. It only depends on how high the higher point you are looking at. And um, do I want to make it easier for myself? Yeah, let's make it easier for me. Uh, this is how, how I'm going to define my coordinate system. I'm going to actually turn this around. Say that this is my y equals 0, and it actually is positive downward. So that at my y equals 0, I'm right at the surface, and my y is actually the depth. So I could say this pressure as a function of y is simply density of fluid times g times y. All of this makes sense? Yeah. So when you look at this cube, there, it has six surfaces. So there are six forces that you would uh, maybe potentially worry about. So let me first point out forces that um, you would end up saying, you know what, I don't worry about them because they are going to balance out. Um, and those are the forces on these four surfaces. Forces on surface one, I'm trying to draw the numbers in the middle of the surface so that you can tell, the left surface, surface one, and force on surface two. Do everyone see how force on one and two will balance out? So on one, you know, there's a rightward force on it, right? Pressure times whatever this area is. And on surface two, there's going to be leftward force on it. Once again, pressure times um, whatever the area is. Both the surfaces have the same area. And well, they're at the same height. Or at least you can pair them as a same height here, and same height here, 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 all the way throughout. You can pair them up. So for each uh, small amount of force that's point pushing to the right, there's a small amount of force pushing to the left. So they'll balance out. And all of this makes intuitive sense. Like before I made this argument, you would have guessed it anyway, based on you know, looking at something like this. It's not really moving left to or right. As the things about liquid changes, it's more about moving up and down. Did this slide over? I thought I drew this in the middle. This slid over, right? Maybe not. I don't know. Let me try to put it back in the center. All right, good enough. <laughs> so, so that's one. And do you see the other pair that will just balance out without us having to worry about it or calculating it? Front and back. Yeah, front and back, right? The other two side the surfaces. So the forces on surface three and four. So there's a force that's pushing into the board, and there's a force that's pushing out of the board. Those two will just balance out. So in the end, I don't really worry about it. So there's really only two forces that has a possibility of not balancing out. It's the force on top and the force on bottom. 
And the reason for that is it comes down to the top and bottom are at two different heights. So when you look at the pressure, uh, pressure at the top is going to be different from pressure at the bottom. Right? At which location do you think you will get greater pressure, top or bottom? Bottom, right? Because it's at a deeper depth, Y is bigger, so pressure is greater. And that actually agrees with what we are hoping to get. At the top, we have a downward pushing force. At the bottom, we have an upward pushing force. And based on what we know about buoyancy force, we would like those two forces to add up in a way that it points upward. So you know, that's just telling us that we are going somewhere <laughs> in the correct direction. So let's uh, write out the expression. And you will see it simplified in a, a perhaps an unexpected way, in a way so that we can give a really simple English sentence statement about buoyancy force. That, um, that's what sometimes called Archimedes principle. So um, let me start by trying to write down the net force, which is what we are going to call buoyancy force. So the net force, I want that force to be upward. So it'll be the force from bottom, force from bottom minus force from top. And if uh, everything works out the way I was hoping, then this will cancel out in a way the bottom will be slightly greater. So all right, F to express force, I go back to my definition of pressure. Pressure is force per area. So force is pressure times area. So I'm just going to suppose that this top and bottom have some area A. Uh, I have a feeling that I don't actually have to write down what that area A actually is. So I'll leave it that way. So the force on bottom and top will be the pressure at the bottom times the area minus pressure at the top, once again, times the area. And this is where, let's uh, try to write out what these expressions for pressure are pressures at the bottom and top. Um, I'm going to use this formula here. Um, I guess, so I could say y bottom and y top, as in, you know, height at the bottom at the, and the height at the top. But let me introduce one uh, more variable to express it in a more descriptive way. So this is the variable I'm going to introduce. For this uh, cube, I will say this cube has some height h. So I'm going to use that uh, variable to describe how the position at y position at the top is related to the y position at the bottom. So let me write that out and see if uh, the expression makes sense. So for the pressure at the bottom, there will be rho g. Uh, times the y position at the top plus h. So uh, density of fluid, uh, I should probably spell it out. Density of fluid times g times for the y, for the depth, it'll be y at the top plus this additional height h, height of the object. Good? That's the pressure at the bottom times the area, all right. Uh, I have to write this also, pressure at the top. It's all very similar except without the H because your Y position is at the top. So this will be minus density of fluid times G times Y position at the top times the same area A. Do you see things canceling out? Yes? What cancels out? Area and G. Well, area doesn't quite cancel out. So I don't mean uh, factors canceling out. I mean H. additive terms. Yes? Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, Y top is the term that cancels out, right? So you know, when you have this written out this way, you have to imagine expanding it out. So what I have written here really is three different terms. 
One of them is already written out here. You just read it off. That's it. This stands for two different terms. One of them is rho g y top a. The other one is rho g h a. So you know, if it helps you to expand this out by hand, look at it on a piece of paper, then you do that. Uh, but I think everyone's goal should be to be comfortable enough with the mental algebra that when you are looking at this, you are comfortable enough with the mental algebra, you can recognize that this is giving rise to a term that will cancel out with this. But you know, if you have to write it out, expand it out first to, to see for yourself, then do that. That's part of getting practice on algebra. So after I've done this cancellation, then I can write, write out the rest. I can say, all right, so the, this net force is the, uh, oh, that's fine, density of the fluid times g times height of this box times the area um, of this bottom surface here. Do we have another expression for that? Height times area? What can we call that? Asia? Yeah, that's the volume of the box, right? Base times the height. That's the volume of any cylinder. And cube is technically a type of a cylinder, I think, maybe. Whatever. Um, so I can call this height times area the volume. This is the volume of the object. And once you realize that you can make one more simplification, actually two more, but one step each. Can I multiply this volume to anything that will have another kind of a physical significance? Combine this volume with something else that's a multiplicative factor in this ex expression. Volume times one of the two remaining factors doesn't mean something physical. Yeah, the density. So you look at the definition of density. Volume times density gives you the mass. So if you multiply this volume, and this is where you have to be careful. This is where I, why I wrote density of fluid. So it's not mass of the box that's submerged that I, um, that I get. It's the, so the, we call it a fluid displaced. It's the mass of the fluid that would have been in this space if that object wasn't there. Does that make sense? Yeah, so let me write it out that way. So this would be equal to mass of, I will just write it down, fluid displaced. This is the fluid that would have, been, would have been present if it could take up the same spot that the object is currently in. And the only remaining factors are here, G. Um, can you see this simplifying one more way? I have mass times G. Mass times G, what is that? It's a weight. It's a weight of a very specific quantity. It's not weight of the object. In that case, you know, it'll always balance out. It's the weight of the fluid displaced. So we can say that this buoyancy force, which is the net force of all, of all of this, this is the simple English expression that we can say that will give you the buoyancy force. We can say that the buoyancy force is equal to weight of fluid displaced. And the little bit of math that we went through here is the proof that buoyancy force is equal to weight of fluid displaced. And this is what um, in some science class, I don't know which one, <laughs> you might have been taught as uh, this is what's known as Archimedes principle. It's one of the few things that Greeks were ever right about when it comes to physics. So. It's worth pointing out. Um, most of the stuff that Greek philosophers say about physics are just wrong, but this is correct. <laughs> um, I guess, I don't know if Archimedes, Archimedes probably didn't work it out this way, but uh, he somehow figured out that this is correct. 
that when you have an object that's uh, submerged under a uh, liquid or under any fluid, but air is so light that it's harder to tell. But when you have any object that's submerged within a fluid, there's a force, upward force on it. And that upward force somehow is equal to the weight of the fluid that would have been there. Um, so this, and this is the proof the, using modern physics that actually shows, yeah, the net force is equal to mass of the fluid displaced times g, which is this. Yeah. So that's a buoyancy force. And that's really the last thing I'm, I can imagine testing you on the final exam. And you know, I, some of you, did it slide again? It slides over time like on its own, right? Yeah, I don't know why that's there. Uh, all right, so, OK. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, uh, um, um, so that's uh, the force you get in this uh, situation. Um, and that actually explains, um, it explains why that, um, why the density of the object has to be less than the density of the fluid to actually float on it. This is how you can kind of imagine it. Um, let me do it this way. Let me get rid of the spring. Um, get rid of this cover. And so, you know, when I have this uh, box, if I'm holding it up here, then it has some amount of weight, right? As I start to submerge this box in water, the amount of force that I have to apply to keep it in air, uh, keep it you know, floating, will go down and down. So you see that as I submerge it, it goes from 45 newtons, and it becomes harder to read. Um, it goes to 30 something newtons, and eventually it'll go down to 20 something newtons. Now, with this particular box, which has twice the density of the liquid, does this ever go down to zero? No, right? I, so because, it's because the buoyancy force, the weight of a fluid displaced, will never be equal to the weight of the object itself. The, because, the object is, uh, because the object is more dense, it will always be a little bit heavier than the fluid that it's displacing. Now, let me change the picture. Let me make it so that, how do I? Oh, I need to zoom out. Um, let me make it so that this is lighter. Um, let me make the density of this material, let's, uh, I guess what I was using before, 0 0.9. So that's the density of the material. So now it's lighter. When, you're, when I'm holding it here, it's only 20 something newtons. And as I start to dunk it in water, it displaces more and more water. So it becomes, uh, the amount of force I have to apply becomes less. And at some point, at some point before it submerges all the way, the amount of force I have to apply will be zero, kinda. So at that point, when I let go, the buoyancy force. So buoyancy force from this much displace the fluid is equal to the weight of the object. So it's balancing out the entire weight of the object and uh, keeping it afloat. Yeah. So um, the special case that you are looking at before, the special case of how do we handle it if the object is only partially submerged, then you can still, actually this is entirely correct as it's stated. Because if an object is only partially submerged, then only this, how do I? So then the amount of water fluid being displaced, it's only this much. The top portion that's not below the water level, it's not displacing any fluid. So we can still say in this case, buoyancy force is equal to, the, the weight of this much fluid in volume. And um, why doesn't it sink down lower? It's because buoyancy force at this level is already equal to the weight. So there's no more downward net force that would uh, cause it to go down. Okay? So that's it. That's uh, it for the buoyancy force. And um, some of you probably knew this already, right? 
This is something that's taught in like high school, no? Maybe, maybe not, doesn't matter. But so this is sort of end of um, what I would attest to you on.